Hi, everyone, and welcome to this uh, special episode of two podcasts coming together, the Stuck in the Mud podcast and Patriarch the podcast. And uh, today um, we're going to be um, recording this podcast in a way that we can post on both sites. And so um, you should go and listen to it on both. And um, uh, before we get on with what we're doing and what we're talking about, um, let's introduce ourselves. So my name uh, for all of your listeners uh, is John Proctor. Um, I'm the um, uh, director of, a, of a, a little charity called Catalyst Youth Trust. I'm a writer and I host the Stuck in the Mud podcast. Hi, I'm, I'm Colin Piper, uh, those who don't know me, and I work for a rather large charity, actually, to be honest with you, called the World Evangelical Lives, uh, together with my wife, Melissa, head up the Converge, which is the global youth movement, bringing together the different youth movements across the globe. And I live in the highlands of Scotland. It's a, what we call a drink day up here today. I don't sound Scottish. I'm actually from London, but uh, don't tell everybody that up here. They think I'm Australian, actually. <laughs> so um so um so just for context um the reason why we know each other um is because um i started out in youth work um 25 years ago uh meeting this uh rather old looking guy um (laughs) who uh, apparently was only 35 but um but uh but i met this guy colin piper and he took me in under his wing with a bunch of other people and uh, and taught me youth and schools ministry over a number of years. So that's kind of how we met. Um, I remember you as um, this old guy. Um, <laughs> what are your recollections of, of, uh, of that? <laughs> Just really, you, you're going to go there, John? Yeah, you're yeah, going to yeah, ask yeah, me yeah, to tell everybody what you this were is, like age 21. This is a safe <laughs> environment. And I was 18. <laughs> it's a safe environment. I was 18. <laughs> 18 were you oh dear this young lad um gosh actually john is why i do youth ministry if i'm honest with you you see a lad like this he thought he knew everything and no one else knew anything myself included and um he he made it very clear that uh, he was god's gift to mankind and (laughs) he led us in worship with that attitude he led us in youth ministry with that attitude but actually to be fair by the end of the year he he realized there were one or two things he needed to learn by the end of the second year he'd forgotten everything and was in an absolute panic that he needed to know relearn the whole thing and that's why I love John because uh, the journey the Lord's had him on it's just been amazing and then John you Louise family you're amazing <laughs> oh bless you mate do you know what that's so <laughs> funny because that is so so bang on and um, and I remember at the end of the first year um coming to you and saying you know things seem to have gone wrong like I don't know what happened and you said something like well you know interesting you know God's God's clearly trying to teach you something and um (laughs) and um, I sort of found myself saying similar things to other people where in the back of my head I'm thinking yeah you're a total numpty Uh, (laughs) and by the way John I was exactly the same I just saw myself in you to be honest with you so don't you you know (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, listen, well, we um, we were talking uh, about doing this podcast mm. and uh, and then uh, we kind of came up um, uh, with this uh, with this theme of coping with change, which is yeah. what we're going to be talking about today. Um, and I certainly wouldn't kind of see myself as any great expert in coping with change, but I know I've had to cope with change. Um, and I thought, you know, um, and, and as we were talking, really good context to kind of uh, ask you first mm. um, from a global perspective what you're kind of seeing around the world and and how people are are, are coping at the moment well you know John uh, we've focused a lot on change because we've had Covid which has blown our, our norm apart we've then got this war in the Ukraine here in Europe which again has blown our world apart but most of the world of course has been struggling with this for a very long time it's only us 
in our complacent, comfortable Western context where mm. um, pandemic, death, war um, it, are intrusive. For most people, it's the norm. A hundred million refugees across the, the planet uh, at the moment, only a tiny percentage of those, tragic percentage, but only a tiny percentage of those are Ukrainians. These are people whose lives have just been uprooted and they've been, um, you know, they find themselves with nothing. And um, meeting guys in those, in those contexts is the most harrowing and yet the most humbling of experiences because you get to meet people who have lost everything. And yet in the midst of all that, of course, you meet those who know Christ and nothing can disrupt them and that's why it's humbling because you realize gosh they have a faith and I just wonder where my faith would take me now we live in a western world where we're having to ask those questions what happens if there's another pandemic what happens if this war goes on what happens if it becomes nuclear what happens if the cost of living goes up that I can't afford the the luxuries I can't even afford the necessities what happens what happens what happens mm. and then we have to ask ourselves this big question is will our faith um, actually survive so we're living in this crazy context at the moment which is on one level a nightmare on another level it's this most rich opportunity to dig deep and to discover what really matters. And for those of us involved in youth ministry, ministry to next gen, this provides the most exciting and yet challenging time out there because our old way of doing things, you know, just keeping the show on the road, running the Sunday night youth group. Uh, I mean, that's yeah, yeah, not yeah, gonna yeah. cut it. It's just not gonna cut it. But if we have courage and if we're prepared to be honest and open and vulnerable to step into places that to where people are hurting then i think we have huge opportunity here mm. what, what are you seeing tell us what you're seeing in the, in the in the beautiful part of the world of stourbridge and telford and wonderful parts like that yeah well it, i think i think one of the things that is really tricky is that knowing somebody like you really puts in kind of quite, quite sort of stark perspective some of the things that that kind of go on in a local community but of course, when you talk to people in a local community, mm. um, it doesn't matter in a sense whether it's on a global scale or on this kind of micro scale. Um, the things that people are struggling with matter really deeply. And what I'm finding is that we're in this mode. And and I'll I'll talk for as a I'll talk as a kind of youth leader practitioner just for a mm. second. There are loads and loads and loads of people like me who have ideas, innovations. Um, kind of projects that we want to do and we're in seem to me that we're in this mode where everyone's trying to sort of solve a lot of problems all at the same time but there aren't enough kind of people to make those changes to to mm -hmm. kind of deal with stuff and so we're in this kind of like hyperactivity burnout moment where we're looking at the world and we're seeing all the problems in the world we're looking at our communities and you know, uh, you know, kind of food banks saying that they're sort of running out of money and food and and things and looking at looking at kind of solutions to issues in a sense, then sort of preaching the gospel or discipling people kind of becomes this kind of sidelined thing next to everything else. But then all of that activity and all of those worries are, are basically meaning that people are kind of stalling as they start. Do you know what I mean? Like I, I'll say, you know, let's go and do this project for all of the kind of worth that I think that it perhaps has attributed to it. Let's go and do this project. And I'll go to someone who would typically be someone who perhaps would help me with that, find they're doing the same thing. And the next person's doing the same thing. The next person's doing the same thing. And we're in this kind of strategic burnout mm. where, where there's, there's so much, um, that feels bonkers you know so much that feels yeah. crazy um yet yet actually we seem to be and I, and I don't like the idea of kind of describing our kind of Christian leadership as sort of running around like a headless chicken but it mm. feels like we're running around like headless chickens church is still streaming but nobody's watching um yeah. Sunday mornings where no one's going to church and I mean this like no one's going to yeah. church yeah, I, yeah. you know um um you know, people are definitely going to church, but you know, the, 
we're putting lots of resources in one thing, but it's not necessarily hitting. And, and, and that's just from a leadership point of view. What's yeah. interesting on the ground is when I speak to the young people that I serve, and that's obviously, mm. you know, one of, the, one of the things I'm really grateful for in my job is I'm still meeting with young people, mm. um, still meeting with their youth leaders and still meeting with their leaders as well. So I'm kind of meeting across the board at the moment. The young people are just going, anybody out there can help me with how I'm feeling anxious? Is there anybody out there who cares about the the sadness? Is there anybody out there who'll give me a little bit of time? And what I'm finding more than anything is that young people are looking for safety mm. um, and uh, looking for places that feel like home and don't feel very safe and don't feel very calm and don't feel very at home. Do you know what I mean? Like there's this real yeah. unease. And so it, it feels very much like, um, you know, our, our strategists are in disarray and our young people are in disarray. And in the middle, there's people like us who are also just the normal people who are kind of going, right, well, what's next? And, and you know, actually one of the things for me has been actually realizing that um, of all the things I'm trying to achieve, I'm also in disarray. Yeah, yeah. You know? I'm so glad you say that, John, because um, what I'm going to say now, first of all, will sound judgmental until I pie it to myself. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> I think the I think we we have we we've got two quite significant problems at the moment. Um, the first is that we've lost that focus on why we do what we do. Now, yeah. if we if we regain that, then I think. Uh, we uh, a lot of things will make sense but once you lose that um, focus nothing makes sense mm. and so as we first of all try to cope with the pandemic and lockdown and we then try to cope with the emerging there's been all sorts of things going on there's been those who are trying to regain the status quo get things back to the way they were though we we forget yep. why they were supposed to be that way i mean yep. that becomes an end in itself we have those who are in denial who are just doing the same thing just doing the same thing because they're just denying what's going on around them and then as you say there are others who are just running around like headless chickens trying to trying to make sense of it but trying to make sense of it in terms of what does this mean for my ministry my church my blah 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 when actually of course here we go it's all about jesus yeah and we we one of the great things about this shake-up is that it is causing us to stop and ask hang on a moment why do we do this why do yeah. we come together at 10 30 why do we stream this stuff why do we run this stuff and and that's not a negative thing i think that's a highly positive thing because it causes you to say well there is a darn good reason why we do it and it's jesus but yeah. unless unless it's revealing jesus it is pointless and I think we've been just doing stuff and stuff is not good enough. Actually, it's got to be for Jesus. That's our first problem. Our second problem is that I think with young people, we've been seeking to deal with the symptoms rather than the causes. You, me you mentioned mm. mental health, for instance, and how do we make people happier? How do we how do we soothe people and with this new phrase, mental health? And yeah. I use that a little bit provocatively, but um, we've got to be careful because mental health covers such a wide sort of wide wide sort of cross-section of meanings that sometimes we dilute the meaning by applying it to to sort of sort of casually but yes. when as long as we're dealing with the symptoms again we're going to be we, we, we're just going to be sort of scurrying around and and, and until we actually deal with the causes what causes people to be unsettled what causes people to feel empty to feel useless what yes. causes people well again i come back it's jesus we mm. were we were made for eternity that's what the writer to ecclesiastes says we've been made beautiful in our time but that time is eternity and so uh, until we get back to those things until we get back to ask the big big question we're not just about church we're not just about youth ministry we're not just about ourselves and this is why i turn it on to myself because I, you know, I have quite a comfortable life, John. It may not feel that way at times, but I've mm. travelled over seventy nations across the world. I've done all. I've had the most amazing life in the name of Jesus. Yeah. Now that's great, 
but actually it's that's not an end in itself and it can become so my ministry becomes what it's all about and mm -hmm. i need to focus again on jesus and what if what if the lord's saying the only way to reach this generation is to cause absolute havoc economically socially whatever to throw everything up in the air and see how it comes down am i prepared for that i've got a very comfortable life up here in the highlands of scotland mm. it's a huge challenge to me but i want to say yes mm. <laughs> but you need to know i put myself in the same boat with everybody else we don't want change we don't want our lives to be too disrupted we don't mind jesus being the excuse for us to have a good life but it yeah. is all about us having our best life and the gospel is not about us having our best life the gospel is about us laying down our life for him mm. and um <laughs> that's life in all its fullness as it happens yes. but it's not our idea of a best life so i i'm i'm walking that road too but i i recognize that that's that's all sorts of challenges and i'm i'm saying father in theory i'm up for this can you make it so in practice please Lord? yes <laughs> yes that's right and i think i think um i think you know picking up a couple of things that you were saying there about our, our, our faith in Jesus, our life, our being rooted and transformed into the likeness of Jesus. Well, what, one of the things that I found a real challenge is when we are talking to people who are actually trying to, uh, and, and, and again, uh, similar to what you said, you know, uh, this is a challenge for me as well. You know, we, we want to uh, create ourselves a perfect bubble where, where there's peace, you know, and, uh, and actually what that does is, is, is it stops us from feeling the things that in a sense, we're supposed to feel anxious yes. about and exactly. we're supposed to feel disquiet mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. and we're supposed to do. And I think, you know, when, when, when Paul talks about being, being um, kind of rooted, um, at, at, you know, actually when you drive down into the ground, you got to actually accept that some of that is going to be uncomfortable when you drive down into the roots of our faith in Jesus, it exposes things that we need to deal with. And, and I think, you know, I mean, it's so many times, you know, we kind of switch off people that disagree with us. We switch mm. off kind of the news because we don't want to hear it. Um, or, you know, we kind of don't like any of this stuff. We kind of say, no, I just want to kind of create my sort of little Island paradise. Mm. And, mm. um, and uh, and actually uh, that that keeps us very surface um it keeps us it keeps us from really understanding that yeah. some of the stuff is supposed to be difficult and it's supposed to hurt yeah i you, you are you ready for this because i'm going to bring patriarch into the story oh yeah do now. it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know i would <laughs> I always do but it's why i why i was always fascinated by the story of abraham there he was a very very wealthy man very comfortable in the most sophisticated of cities of the day uh you know i had everything from libraries all those sciences it had mm. all the all the infrastructure all the architecture it was a beautiful city he was living mm. well doing well but there was an emptiness inside him i put it down to the fact he had no kids that was his legacy that was in the, in the day that's that's really what made you a man and he had he had that lacking in his heart and so i have him reaching out to the lord and the lord responds to that because he yeah. always does but then the lord asked him to do something which is which is just so crazy he says you've got to leave everything Mm. gonna leave all the sophistication all the comfort all the security and he takes him to live in the desert in a foreign land amongst the hostile people mm. in the midst of famine in all sorts of risks and threats and insecurities and yet it was there abraham met god if he'd mm. stayed living in ur i don't think he would have done so uh, <laughs> Well, you never know for sure, but you, but this was the Lord's mm. way to reveal himself. And that for me, the story of patriarch is the story of, of Abraham entering into the very heart of the revelation of God. And mm. that's the beauty of the story where he reaches that moment where he can even sacrifice his only, well, his, one of his two sons, yeah. because he, he believes God. There's such a depth and a richness and a beauty of faith, all the ups and downs, all the craziness of it. And it's such a beautiful story. But it it took that absolute disruption yeah. of his whole life 
And I wonder if um, at the outset, Abraham had been said, look, this is what it's really going to cost you. He must have had a pretty good idea. But if he knew it all, I wonder whether he would have gone, oh, is that worth it? So yeah. often the Lord just takes us on the journey. And it's only as we look back, we realize just, you know, how rocky the road has been and <laughs> yeah. how destructive. But when we do look back, of course, we say, thank you, Father. Um, there's times in my life where uh, I often say I wouldn't wish this upon anyone but I wouldn't have missed it for the world yeah. and that's the journey of discipleship if we yeah. truly want to get into the heart of God I think mm. I think um, uh, I think what one of the really interesting things about our um, and I just want to kind of pivot here a second because I think that that is sort of so so helpful and as you were talking I was thinking about people that typically listen to my podcast versus perhaps people that would typically listen to your podcast and i i don't know kind of how you i'm not kind of... sure yours are all that much dumber than mine i mean at the end of well... the day I, mean, <laughs> I guess let's not be too let's not let's not be too definitive about no 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 okay. sure 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 um so so the so i'm um, looking at the kind of demographics on my podcast um i do uh i do have uh, a kind of a real mixture of people who some who are really interested in faith some who are are Christians and are on a discipleship journey. I've also got a big uh, group of people who listen to me for the kind of personal development side of things. Mm. And and I think you know we're talking today around this whole thing of change. Um, mm. I think that 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 we kind of touched on some really interesting things, particularly from your perspective. I think of the world. Um, what, one thing that I, I'd like us to 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 be able to kind of perhaps speak into a little bit is 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 some of the practicalities of coping uh with change in our in our lives because i think mm. you know I, there's a guilt i think when i hear your story and i come on a call with you and we talk um <sighs> you know not super regularly but we but we talk and and i've got mm. stuff going on here and then i hear about you with people around the world and i think oh flip i better shut up mm. because mm. um because the stuff i'm going through <laughs> doesn't matter at all but of course it does matter and the yeah, people that true. the people mm -hmm. that are i don't know i'll use the example but i don't mean it as as a literal you know my next door neighbors are are coping with change on and it's massive and 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 i think you know how do we kind of apply this to someone who is who's in the middle of some crap and, and who's thinking how do i get out how do I cope with this? How do I get out of this? What what should I expect? Hmm. Well, first of all, that guilt thing, um, I feel that every day because it, um, today where my, I'm, I'm calling various parts of the world, Latin America later, um, Africa later. And uh, um, when, you, when you talk to folks, your life suddenly becomes very small, yeah. <laughs> and very, at times very silly. But that's not how God sees it, of course. And that's the beauty of our Father, who's infinite, yeah. that nothing's too big, but also nothing's too small. Yeah. Um, but actually, I, it's also a privilege to have a perspective. And mm. one of the ways I cope, and <laughs> I wish I could say it was my idea, but it, it wasn't. The, when I went through probably the biggest crisis of my life, almost certainly the biggest crisis of my life, just a couple of months, a couple of weeks it was actually thinking about it before then, as I was having a devotional time, a personal time with the Lord, which is, of course, essential, I, I, I just sent the Lord say, start keeping a journal. And I hadn't kept a journal up to that mm. point. And so I did. And it did two things. Number one, it gave me time and space to really reflect and think. Number two, it gave me a reference point. And this is this I had no idea about until a bit, or a bit further on when I needed it. And mm. I would go back and I would look, what was I thinking? What was I feeling? What was I seeing at that time? And it's, it, it's created this narrative of my life and particularly of God's dealing in my life, which mm. reminds me of how of his faithfulness but it also reveals to me what's going on in my heart and yeah. the evolution of that or the non-evolution at times of that wow. and that has actually been a massively significant uh, way of coping with change it's enabled me i think 
to live the life I've lived. And I'm so grateful to God that mm -hmm. I had that record. I go as far as saying this, if I hadn't had that record, I wonder if I would have made it because right. it was such a confusing time to be able to look back and say, Oh yeah. Okay. That's what was, that's what happened. That's what's going on. That's what God was doing to have that kept me sane. Wow. That's so wise actually, Colin. I think, I think, um, uh, I, I've, I'm not sure that I've ever taken journaling very seriously, but I know people love it. But I think one thing that I would say from my own experience that that perhaps is similar to that is that I tend to only write what's going on around me. And so um, although I wouldn't call it journaling as such, because I don't tend to write anything unless it's impacted my heart or hurt me in some way or um mm. Or, or felt difficult mm. um the, the writing that i do well in my book um my mm. book stuck in the mud um um and on my and on my website if i if i post a blog you can almost you can almost be certain that something's happened big and something's sort of deeply impacted me or something's been difficult um, just simply because I don't seem to be able to kind of, I don't sort of go, oh, well, let's sit down and write today. It's, it's always about reflecting on something that's, that's mm. difficult. Um, and I think looking back at some of that stuff, mm. um, has been, has been really helpful. Interestingly enough, the Bible that I was given by my dad, when I, which I was, I was given, um, to go into youth ministry with. So it was the Bible I had throughout mm. our time together. Um, I, I frequently go back to the things that I wrote on that Bible. And people mm. always tell me that, uh, that it's, um, you know, I've done a terrible thing on that Bible. And I always tell them, well, Colin Piper told me to write on my Bible. <laughs> I was going to say, um, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> which is something you frequently, frequently said and did. Um, yeah. But I always wrote things that, got, that people had spoken into my life on that. Um, I wrote things that God was saying to me on that. I wrote promises that I felt that God was speaking over my life on that. And I will frequently go back to that. In fact, it's, I mean, it's just out of my life. It's literally just on the top of a bookshelf over there. Um, I will frequently go back to that because that reminder is part of the anchor, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> so yeah, you know my Bible. I, I've had it. I bought it on the second of October, nineteen eighty-two. How about that? It's yeah. uh, it's going to be forty year old, and it's with me every day because it's not just God's word; it's God's word to me. It's my my word from God, and mm. I open it and I see those little phrases uh, in in the margins, and I remember the time, the time, and that that when that verse came alive in that context, and and resulted in whatever, mm. and you know so again this is corny um but it's true isn't it everything else may fade away but the word of god never fades away and that's why feasting upon it just holding it tight that is the one thing it's my most treasured possession that bible because of all that god has said to me over 40 years of that that wow. bible sort of uh, <laughs> little sudden with me it's just been it's, it's that precious to me so i, I get it and I, I know we know that but actually coping with change you need things that you can that are stable that aren't going to change but we we reach out for all sorts of things mm. in terms of relationships and other things which which are good and they are good mm. but actually they're not they're not eternal they're not necessarily gonna last forever yeah um the word of god does and that mm. that that is what i've told everybody yourself included yeah yeah that's 41 right years plus of ministry i don't know how long <laughs> oh yeah my mine's 25 um for, for those of you listening or watching this um who who enjoy a good picture analogy there's there's a story that i heard uh, which I think fits really nicely into this, because one mm. of the things that I hear kind of under what you're saying, Colin, mm. is this idea of, uh, and in fact, I think you just said it a second ago, but 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 the the stability of 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 remaining in God's word, mm -hmm. um, and I think one of the things that um, really struck me, and this actually only happened this morning, but I was I was totally captivated by it. I was watching this video, and my older daughter. Had, was was kind of watching over my shoulder at one point and uh, said she'd seen it before um uh, but i've never heard of this thing before 
And it's about rocks that move in Death Valley in the Mojave Desert. And it's a fascinating thing. Apparently, um, uh, apparently what what's happened over about 100 years, people have observed that these rocks and they're massive that would take like a bulldozer to move. They're that sort of size. These rocks are actually traveling across the desert and they're actually they've renamed them <laughs> sails. So these rocks are called sails. Now, <laughs> the mystery of it is um, is that they're moving uphill they're completely immovable objects um yet they are traveling and they've been tagged with gps trackers they are exactly moving and people have had theories about how this has been happening you know they thought maybe uh, one of the theories was maybe um uh, there's there's some sort of animal um another one was maybe there's this incredible kind of wind movement like maybe there's gales that that scream through this valley maybe that's what's doing it and and what they've discovered and they discovered this only a few years ago what they discovered was that there's a perfect condition for the rock to move and it and it is and it is not regular but it's transformative and what happens is first of all now this is like one of the hottest places in in on on the planet right but in the winter time, it gets so cold, it freezes. So what happens is the first condition is that it has to be winter. The second condition is that it needs to rain. Then it needs to freeze. And then the, then the fourth condition is the most bonkers one, which is that once all of those things have happened, if there is a slow, steady breeze, then the entire... Um, water frozen water mass with the rock travels up the hill and it's almost completely impossible to observe yet these rocks have moved like i mean it i, I can't remember exactly how long this particular flat is it's something i, I don't know it's like a hundred so kilometers they've moved across the entire thing and you'd think that it was impossible except that in the correct conditions and and what i loved is that if 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 it was frozen and a gale they wouldn't move but the fact that it was frozen and there's this slow steady breeze it pushes the entire thing slowly up the hill and that's the solution to the problem it's this riddle and i remember i just this morning i was sat there and i was thinking my word like there's something quite beautiful about that, but there's something that I kind of recognize about the way that God moves in that as well. Mm -hmm. When I yeah. look at something yes. and I want to escape it, but actually if I remain rooted, that yeah. God will slowly move me. And I think this idea of your journal is almost, you look back and you think, how, yes. did, I, yeah. how did I move? Yes. And you look back exactly. and you go, actually it was this yeah. slow, steady movement of the spirit. Yeah. But I just, it really yeah. struck me as a practical analogy yeah. of oh, that's something that was really story. beautiful. Yeah, I see that. I've never heard that before. Um, that, But it is fantastic, isn't it? And here's the thing. It's, the, it's God who gives those perfect conditions because he's perfect. He's, mm -hmm. you know, he is the God of all history. He's, he's the, the hand. He's the one we trust behind everything. Mm -hmm. And that, that, oh, John, that's a great story. I think we need to wrap up on that one. Oh, well, I mean, I think that's a perfect sort yeah. of place. I think, I think, <laughs> I think we could we could talk for a long time. But I think uh, how yeah. lovely and 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 I mean, just kind of recapping. We talked about the guilt. We've talked about change. We talked about the world. We've talked about our localities. I think you know. I hope that for those who are listening, that there's been something today that's inspired you and helped you and uh, mm -hmm. and encouraged you to um to 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 well i mean to allow god to do what god does so beautifully slowly carefully but meaningfully in our lives yeah and uh, can i just say that all patriarch listeners do do uh, have a listen to to john and stuck in the mud because uh, he's got a lot to say now he's not that brash 18 year old I met those <laughs> <laughs> john thank you that's amazing no. Thank you. And similarly to Stuck in the Mud listeners, go and find Patreon, the podcast. It is a brilliant story. I've listened to it and read it uh, two or three times uh, since Colin first published it. And hearing him read it 
is probably the best way to take it in. So go and find Patriot, the podcast. It's a wonderful story um, as well. So thank you so much, mate. Thank you. Take care. Oh, <laughs>